You're listening to the Uncensored Direct Marketing Show. This show is designed for direct response marketers who want raw, unfiltered conversion tips and secrets to scale their offers profitably to reach their next million. I'm Maria Sparagas. I'm the founder of Direct Paint It and your host. Now let's dive in. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to this week's episode of Uncensored Direct Marketing. My guest on today's show is Brennan Hopkins. Brennan is an email copywriter. I talked to Brennan about how he went from barely being able to make rent to now being able to choose the clients that he works with. He also has built his life around a four-day work week and treasures balance and fun in his life. The interesting thing that Brennan reveals is that just writing email copy kept him from truly being successful. It is when he combined his writing with technology to help manage a list where things really took off for him. Brennan wrote a course called Lean and Mean Email Marketing. He has regular training teaching the ins and outs of Clavio and is all around a master at his craft. Brennan gives very insightful advice and doesn't reinvent the wheel. His perspective is refreshing and raw. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed speaking with Brennan. As usual, if you have any comments or questions for me or Brennan, feel free to drop me a line on my website, mariasparagis.com. That's M-A-R-I-A-S-P-A-R-A-G-I-S.com. And I hope you enjoy today's episode. So thank mm-hmm. you so much, Brennan, for being on Uncensored Direct Marketing today. Um, Brennan Hopkins and I connected on Facebook, uh, yep. just like a lot of other guests that I've had on the show. So uh, I've been following Brennan for a couple of months now and and reading about your 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 advice on email and, and how to nurture a list. So Brennan, uh, thank you so much again for being on the show. And I just wanted you to t- say a couple of things about your experience and what you're working on to our guests. Yeah, well, uh, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for having me on Santa Maria. It's awesome. I Yeah, it's crazy. It's almost it's almost 11 p.m. here, but <laughs> time zones are crazy. I um, But as you mentioned, I am an email marketing uh, expert and direct response copywriter. So I actually started as a copywriter uh, nearly five years ago. Um, and then got brought on with an agency and just basically made myself useful uh, and learned all the ins and outs of email marketing and then found that people were very ready or very willing to pay for someone that could offer both copywriting and email marketing together. And so just hit about four years back in January, I guess, of doing email marketing. And so... Yeah, at this point, I've, I've worked very heavily in the e-commerce space uh, for most of that. And now I'm working with a financial guru. And I also just recently launched a low, a low ticket kind of basics. Well, basically the email marketing course I wish I had when I started out four years ago, I just created, uh, it's low ticket. It's And it's pretty much as, as inclusive as you can get. And I'm still adding things. I just did like a live Clavio training uh, last week that I uploaded in there. So that's pretty much um, a mixture of uh, client work. And then now building out a little bit of some of my own things and helping empowering other people to have success with email. Well, thank you. I mean, thanks for, for letting our guests know about your, 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 uh, your course. Um, I mean, right now, like I, like I was telling you before, I'm looking to start an email list. I've been talking about this forever. If anybody's been following me, they think they're like, she's never going to start it. I will one day I'm going to start an email list. I have, um, I have you know, quite a bit of email um, that, you know, that we've gathered over the years, B2B. Mm-hmm. So I am definitely getting your training for whoever I bring on board. I'm not going to do it myself. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's <laughs> or maybe you can help us. But yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is a little bit different, the B2B. I, just question, this is a, a personal question, I guess, but that's all right. I guess as well, B2C versus B2B email. What, what's the, do you have any experience in that or any opinions or thoughts? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, so at the end of the day, it's still people. So the, how we t- communicate when it's another per like that's not going to change. However, context, it depend like impacts email communication a ton. If anything, your audience, it's, it's, um, is the sole definer of how you in, how you customize your email marketing, which is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate passionate and I love it so much is because you can actually tailor it to your specific audience. So um, a lot of B to C things are a bit different because you tend to be selling them something 
that they're going to use tangibly in their life. Whereas like B2B, you're selling them an asset that will help them accomplish their goal typically. Okay. So do you, do you find that like, if you're communicating to a business, uh, you have to be less personal or do you still kind of hit them with the personal stories when you're doing uh, B2B? Oh, sure. Well, so personal, what I guess you kind of have to defer, define what you mean by personal because stories doesn't necessarily mean personal. Um, that's just kind of, that's, that's more of how you're relating to them. Um, I will say that apart from very specific industries, a more laid back, normal tone just works better. So that's yeah. what I would say personal as far as like, does this sound like that this came from a normal person on the other end. That's how I would define personable. Yeah. Stories as a mechanism or a method for selling, I've, of course, 100% effective. So like, because like I said, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who the person is, if they're biz- at like what business they're in, they're still a human with experiences. They still experience um, pain. They still have problems. They still have hopes and dreams albeit framed within their business, but their experience is still essentially human. So you're going to be communicating with them in a very similar way. Um, When I was, I I would put together some emails once for a a software as a service company that um, was selling a, a video software. And the thing is, is Ultimately, at the end of the day, the people's pain points were, I I found the pain points the same way that I would find it if I was selling like supplement, honestly. Um, So it's kind of a similar, just because they're in business doesn't mean that they're feeling anything different. It's just framed a little differently. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm a business owner, right? And I buy products. I'll buy supplements. I'll buy stuff. And I also buy products for my business. I feel the most effective way to communicate with me is something that's going to save me time. So, Mm. you know, and talk to me, I I find like we're on a lot of lists for different, you know, third-party services and stuff like that. We just like to know what's happening with people are selling Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, And I do find that, you know, the, the B2B emails are still very like, you know, advertising ish, like Mm -hmm. image static and just like, Hey, here's this special with no kind of talking or anything like that. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I I don't read those very much. So I think, you know, what you're saying is having something more personal and something more kind of like just talking to somebody like they're a human being, even though they're a business owner, even though maybe they, you know, their CFO or whatever the case is, it's still going to probably be a better, you know, sales tactic than here's 20% off and a coupon and, you know, just buy this makes no sense. So um, thank you for that tip. I'm going to, I'm going to use it. It's, it's very difficult. Um, I feel like hiring somebody for an email list is, is, something that I find very difficult for me personally, because I have a voice and a lot of my clients know me very well. And I feel like my clients would be like, that's not Maria. That's mm-hmm. not, you know, so f- how, how would you go about like, if you were a business owner um, and like, whether you're selling supplements, whatever the case is, how would you look for somebody to be an email copywriter for your business? Like what, yeah, what kind so, of stuff would you look for, for them to do? Well, I mean, the, first thing that you have to do is you have to like come to terms with, are you actually okay truthfully with passing this off to someone? Because n- no one is actually going to be able to be you. <laughs> yeah. um, so I know, I mean, you can get really close and I, you see those glowing testimonials for the copywriters that they're like, yeah, this person totally captured my voice. And that's really good. Like a great copywriter will be able to do that. Yeah. Um, however, there's an aspect of like, you, you know, business owner probs, like this is my baby. I'm relinquishing this for the overall greater good. And so you do have to kind of come to terms with first, and then you have to figure out what your, I guess what your margin of error is (laughs) for how much of a, how, how, how much are you willing to like actually then entrust an expert? Because if you bring someone on, um, they're going to be, if the, they're, they sh- should be looking out for your best interest, which means maybe doing things a bit differently than what you initially had in mind. Um, okay. so, um, really, <laughs> that's a really like, uh, 
uh, deep concepts, but the, um, as far as someone that's worked with, you know, 35, I don't even know how many people I've, I didn't track very well in the early days. Cause I was just, you have a lot of voices. Then you must be able to get a lot of people's voices. Like what, what maybe the better question is how do you position yourself to learn how to speak like the business that you're representing? Is there research involved? Do you interview? Oh yeah. Well, I just try and consume as much as they can, what uh, I can of them. So like what, what I was going to say, actually, one of my suggestions before you changed the question was like, I would just have you write out emails for a little while. Like even if you could sit down and write out some, so we could even see what, like, what would you say? Okay. Um, How would you, what would you talk about this? Um, But this is cool. It's cool because people, we're all wired differently. So everyone's going to learn that they need to figure out like what works best for them. So my method is not going to work best. I'm a sensory learner. So I need to like consume. I need to visually like, I I need it all. I need all my senses stimulated for me to like be able to, and then it kind of feels like it gets imprinted as a framework in my brain. And then that becomes what I'm pulling from whenever I'm working. Like I have, it's like this little structure. It's like, this is these types of things. Um, I guess, but I, I only, I really only knew that because I lived abroad when I was 19 and learned a second language. And so then I all of a sudden was thrust into the situation where I had to learn something from scratch. And then I was like, Oh wow. I learned that about myself. Which language? Um, uh, Spanish. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I I know I know vacation Spanish, so I can't I can't even. That's great. With you. <laughs> oh no, that's okay. Yeah, I lived in Argentina for a year when I was nineteen. So awesome. It was yeah, but I I guess if you're looking for, I'm I I can tell you over like big things, but there's so many different types of people out there. There's so many different service providers, and really the bigger thing is the fit. So you're looking for someone that's competent and someone that you can work with. Like that's ultimately what you want at the end of the day, someone that you trust their expertise that you can actually relinquish that to them. And then someone that's going to be a good fit for you. Like those are your top tier things for providing, for hiring someone from there, then you can work out all of the things. But if there are so many different types of email provider, like email uh, marketers yeah people are going to have their own style people are going to do it differently you as yourself you have your brand so you're looking for someone that's actually most in alignment with your brand that can leverage their expertise for your benefit okay so i mean would you say that it's you know yourself as an email marketer do you stick to specific industries do you find that email marketers are best to kind of let's say we have a, a email marketers kind of listening or people who are copy looking to get into to email marketing. Would you say like kind of carving out a niche and being like a, a, a health or supplement uh, writer is best or is it easy? I feel like for cof- copy, just I'm listening I'm, and I'm obviously not a copywriter. I feel oh, for copy, right, yeah. it's a little bit easier to transition from industry to industry where I feel like it's a little bit more difficult with email because there's so much um, and there's probably just a lot more, I mean- not content, long copy could be really long, but I'm saying like email, you have to maybe have three emails a day or whatever the case is. So do you find that it's easier for you to focus on one specific industry or do you kind of like to bounce around and, and try different niches? I, yeah, I thrive a bit on the change a little bit. So I like having my hands in a couple like different pie, like hands, whatever, sticks in the fire, hand the pies. I don't know what the phrase <laughs> is. Anyways, I like that. It, it's nice because it gives me a separation. Whereas I find that if I'm doing the same, a lot of the same type of work, it blends poorly and can like impact okay. my ability to, to serve the clients. That is personality though. I'm kind of like ADD ish. <laughs> Not officially, I haven't ever tried to get a diagnosis, but like, so the hard switches, although I probably lose an aspect of productivity, I know that I provide superior stuff Okay. because they get, they get, um, I'll, it might be influenced from other niches, but they're getting something that's distinct to them. 
Okay. So uh, it's so, also maybe you're, you're like, if you're doing three health brands, they might all start sounding the same a little bit. Yeah, exactly. That yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like it becomes very, it can become very hard. And like, as so that there's, I'm going to do kind of like two things here. First of all, if you're working with an email, it, like if it's a solo provider, they're, it's a freelancer, they're working with multiple brands. Like that's just how it has to be because no one's going to pay you <laughs> for part-time hours what you want to make for in sure. a month. Um, that's just not how it is. So the reality is, and, and, and the truth is agencies are doing the exact same thing. Like that's how they're hitting their, that's how they're hitting their KPIs is they've got a butt ton of clients. <laughs> and maybe they have, three copywriters, maybe they have one, you know, I don't know. It depends. <laughs> you just on make the, him the do everything. Structure. He's working 80 hours yeah, a week. Well, it does. <laughs> I mean, mixed feeling. I'm not going to get into all of my agency feelings here, but um, the second thing is copy is very important, but less important than actually emailing. Okay. Ooh, interesting. Oh, we should get a copywriter on here. This would be juicy. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm getting to that question, but now, now you said something really juicy. Cause I was going to say, you know, what, do you do copy and email? How did you transition from one to the other? But now you're saying that copy, you're saying it, does it, are you saying it takes more skill or more knowledge? Like tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that. I'm saying sending any emails are better than sending are is better than sending no emails. Okay. <laughs> Regardless of the quality. Uh, oh, wow. Really, okay. For instance, I'm just to show you like one of, one of my e-commerce brands that I've been with, with a long time, you know, the store is, it's not really built in a way that's going to grow, but it can maintain a decent level. So it's fine. Yeah. I, I had my wife, take my course and write out some emails for me and I plug them in and it would be hard to say, I'd, although it was only a few, you know, I would be hard pressed to say I could guarantee that I would beat that because wow. of, um, in that moment, because that like with email you have, you have, a bajillion different factors. You have the life cycle of your, like the life cycle of your customer. You have what's going on. You have how valuable is the promotion, how valuable is whatever you're sharing. Like all those types of things are coming in. Yeah. And um, if you think about how it's pretty much impossible, if you're making, if you're cooking with fresh ingredients, it's, it's impossible to guarantee that it's always going to taste the same Yeah, because you never know how, if something's going to be good or not <laughs> like the quality of it. Um, and so that, that factor comes into play with, with email marketing as well. Copy is still really important and it can uh, like when I, I got to, I did a stint with athletic greens last year and I went in like we have, we had ultimately had about a 50% increase in their, um, in their conversions, their, their opens to conversions or what I, I can't remember. Now it's 50% increase in email conversions oh, when wow. I was working with them. That's huge. Which is huge. Something, yeah. something to that number. That's massive. We didn't change how we were emailing. We changed what we were talking about in the emails. Okay. Well, I mean, so you're kind like, of warming people up, right? By email. So, I mean, I, I kind of have to agree that if you're doing a great job emailing and, and the copy and email is really good, somebody's like 75% warm by the time they get to the sales page. So once they get to that sales page, if the copy's decent, you're, you're kind of done or unless you, do you, from email, do you directly send them to like an order page usually? Like what's the flow? Well, so that it's totally niche dependent. So for my e-commerce clients, they're just going to like, a, they're just going to the store page. Okay. So that it doesn't, it, you kind of, you have to pre-sell them because there isn't a, this beautiful long landing page that's going to address everything. They're just going to, you know, if you get an email from Nike, uh, obviously they're going to be more stylized, but they're not shipping you to a page to where they're 
telling that that's a full sales page for their tennis shoes. Yeah. <laughs> um, <that's laughs> They're just not, sending not... you to the one that you're, you're looking to buy. That's in the email, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's but how about it, for direct it, so. response? Like what's your experience with, let's say health, you know, like our, our traditional kind of like weight loss supplements or anything kind of health beauty. Do you usually, have you ever tested like sending somebody directly to a checkout page versus sending them to a, like a long form sales letter or to a VSL? Like what's usually a good, good thing that works for like direct response? Yeah. So I have a lot less experience working with in the direct response space because I work so heavily with e-commerce and then okay. even the supplement, even athletic greens is set up as an e-commerce company. Oh, wow. Okay. So they're, they're not, they're pretty anti direct responses and like, they like, we tried this and it didn't fit well for us. So we're oh, nice. going, they, they do more of the e-commerce, the, um, guru, the financial guru that, that I work for, we link, I, it depends on what the offer is, but, the goal of the basically um, it's, it's essentially like this. If what you're sending them to can sell them, you're just selling, getting them to that. Okay. <laughs> if that's what your goal or your objective is, get them to that. Okay. So basically you're saying if you have a strong sales letter and you've kind of invested a lot there, the email marketer's goal is just to get them on that page, not to sell them before. Cause then you're double selling them. Is that correct? Okay. Or you would, you're basically, you're, ex, you, you are, it's really fatiguing the opportunity. Okay. Because you have a, a, a short window to engage with this person and pique their curiosity enough. So if you put them into something that's a long form mini sales letter, then link them over to another long form mini sales letter. Sure, some people are, some people will still convert, but you're going to see a big drop off just because they're going to be tired. <laughs> okay. I agree. I agree. When, when I get like really long, I find emails like, um, you know, very, very long. And then I get to a page and it does it. It's not the page, you know, the, for me, the number one mistake, and this is just anecdotal as a consumer, I'm like, like on Wayfair and stuff like that. I, I buy a lot of stuff online. <laughs> like my mm -hmm. whole life is online. And I find, especially Wayfair is pretty bad at, they send emails and it's like this beautiful table and you're like, Oh, I like this table. You click. And they just bring you to something that has nothing. I was like, I was just going to buy that table. Why didn't you just yeah. send me to the table? You know and I'm like, this mm -hmm. should be, and I, I obviously I'm not a marketer, but I work with a lot of very intelligent marketers. And I'm like, this is like one Oh one, right? Like you're, you're showing yeah. me this table. Why are you bringing me somewhere else? You know, I'm not, obviously, I, you know, I just That's lost great. interest. So I guess I feel like I, I, I understand what you're saying, you know, overselling them or even underselling them or, or not kind of being the consumer's mind when you're emailing. It's it's a more personal experience than, than you know, maybe a VSL or whatever the case is. It's you're really kind of, you have to make them feel like you're talking to them specifically mm -hmm. with the email. Um, yeah talking about email and, and, and talking to the person and so forth, I'm wondering techniques or, you know, this is one thing that I found very interesting about what you said is emailing is better than non-emailing. So that's one tip I'm going to remember. Cause I always try to be a perfectionist and then everything yeah. before I, I launch, but I'm going to take your advice, but I'm wondering what kind of techniques or strategies do you use? Do you email people? Like I hear the rule is once a day. Is that too much, too little, like depending on the market, what, what do you find is I guess best practices for somebody starting or trying to nurture a list? Yeah, sure. I mean, you kind of can decide. Yeah. If you're starting out, you can kind of decide the biggest thing is what's actually sustainable for you, because that's more important. Um, you can always add or subtract, but you, it's always easier to add if you find that you have the margin for that. Um, so that's what we're starting at. I th obviously, if you're hiring someone out, <laughs> then it's a little different. I find that gurus can get away with emailing more. Okay. Uh, typically because it's a bit more personable. Um, whereas a lot of you'll like a lot of e-commerce companies don't send out daily emails because people with, I, I can do about four ish emails a week, unless we have a promotion, um, over like over a few days where I can do more and Otherwise, I'll start to see subsequent drop-offs on engagement. So basically, you, 
you essentially will start to, if you, you can see your numbers start going down across the board. And uh-huh. that means that you're not necessarily actually engaging with more people. They're just splitting themselves over the more opportunities. Okay. So they're opening less of your emails. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, I'm saying mm-hmm. like, if you have, say you go to X amount of, e- if you increase by two emails yeah. and then you notice at down the road, you probably won't see the change immediately, but if you notice it's like two or three weeks down, oh, my overall open rates are lower than I used to be, than they used to be. There's no guarantee that you're actually collecting a bunch of new opens. Okay. Just because um, you you're emailing to, more doesn't mean that people are going to be opening and reading it more, basically. Yeah, it doesn't guarantee that they are. It can, um, yeah. but I'm, I've am i worked with so many smaller businesses and medium businesses that don't have the resources, that don't have the brand, like the, the solid brand in place yeah. to where I... I don't preach a daily email because I know it's not actually beneficial for them. Oh, they're wow. better off. They're better off allocating their resources for something else. But it's really funny when we operate, like I know the people that you've interviewed um, and, and they operate like in a they the people that they operate with, it's very different. So like yeah. if you're spending hundreds of thousands or of dollars or whatever on ads, you know, if your lead gen is, is that high, well, yeah, you can email people every day because your leads are massive. Yeah. So you're just that, that that's the name of the game. But if you're, if you're a small business and you know, you're not bringing in all of these types of types of leads, you have to be a bit more conscientious um, email, like a healthy email list will have about a 33% attrition rate in any given year. A wow. healthy one will wow. go down by 30. That's like huge. a poorly maintained one will go down by 65 per like 60% or more. So churn is huge yeah. to begin with. If you're a smaller business and you're not, you don't have all these other brand infrastructures in place, you can damage it. Like you, it won't be beneficial to do that. Okay. If well, you've I'm got happy a that big you say business, that. If you've got a big business and you're churning in all these people, then heck yeah, like you can email more than once a day probably and you'll be fine because your your numbers are huge. But it's so, this is a pet peeve of mine, but like email is, it, it's not one size fits all because no business is the same. No, I, I agree. And, and, you know, I think one of the reasons that I, um, haven't pulled the trigger is because everybody's like, you got to email once a day. I'm like, I don't think I have enough things to say for once a day. I mean, I, I I, like, what am I going to talk about for once a day? And, and, you know, obviously I want to keep people engaged. And and, I mean, I guess I have the old adage of like, it, wouldn't that be annoying? Like, wouldn't that annoy me if somebody emailed me once a day? Um, There are some people that I get once a day, like I'm on uh, Justin Goff's uh, email list and, and, you know, I I love reading his emails every day, um, but they're short, right? So it's like, it's, it's not, it doesn't take too much time and, and, and it doesn't feel too salesy either. Um, but then, you know, there's other ones that I get like, you know, that are about visa or MasterCard news and stuff like that. And that's fine. Once a week, I get a little digest. That's perfect. Yeah, right. So, exactly. I mean, it's, it's interesting that you say that because the gurus and the people that, you know, I speak to a lot are always all for this, like once a day email as much as you can and stuff like that. And it seems overwhelming for some of the business owners or some of the smaller businesses that, you know, maybe don't have budgets or don't really are just starting out. So when you start out and it's like, Oh, you have to email once a day. It's, it seems like it's such a huge mountain. Like, at least for me, I'm like, I don't, I I don't know how I'm going to manage this. I'm going to hire somebody to do it for sure. But, um, it's still, you know, there's, I'm the type of business owner where I need to know, like understand what it is that I'm hiring for. So I almost have to do it a little bit and then be like, okay, now I can, I can let, so that's why I, yeah. I you know, you know, I have all these like issues with HR that I talked to Stefan uh, George about in one of my yeah. last episodes. But you know, if, if you're that type of business owner, especially for an email list, like you said, is very personal. It's very finding somebody who can really represent you. Uh, once a day is, is, is uh, scary, you know, like, whereas would you say once a week is not enough? Is there like, what's your, if somebody's just starting, like, for example, let's say I came to you and I said, Brennan, you know, I have a list of five, 6,000 emails, B2B. 
what do we do? What would be your, your first inclination once a week, twice a week, or. Oh, no, I would shoot for probably two to three times a week. Okay. That would Depend- be a good starting the thing, point. The thing is, is it, it depends on what you have in place. Like what does your business look like structure wise? What can we, in my mind, you can email as often as you have something legitimate to talk about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I, so if, if you and I sit down and we're like, well, we could legitimately tell them three th- these three, th- like three different times a week, we could talk to them about these things. That's a great place to start. And then you just see what happens. Okay. Like, well, that's I mean- the beauty of email is it's trackable. Yeah. I love this about that is it's trackable. So you just, you just do that thing for a few weeks and then you take a step back and you go, Hmm, how is this going? Okay. Um, I just recently did the stats for uh, the other day, big do, doing engagement, uh, an engagement report for the, the guru client. And he's, he's a seven figure, you know, client business. And he's, he's more in the direct response style. So we've upped him. He was doing two emails a week and we've now got him at like six ish emails a week, unless we're doing a promotion and we have more. And it's okay. basically four are more sales related and two are more content related is what the thing is. And our, um, we've had a negligible amount of people fall like of engagement. If anything, actually, we've segmented down and we lost some of the opens, but our click-throughs have been the same. Oh, wow. Well, see, yeah, I mean, you, if you have something interesting to say, that's a good good point. But what what about like, you know, you're talking about engagement. How do you, what are some techniques that email copywriters can use or businesses can use to drive up engagement? Is it like reply with your thoughts or I get different, I, I'm always studying people's emails and I'm like, oh, you know, sometimes people say reply yeah. to this email if you like this. I'm like, no, I don't like, unless there's something for me to say, me telling you I like it, whatever. <laughs> well, that's it. So you have to, it's all going to come back to, first of all, do you have the infrastructure to support what you're telling people to do? Okay. So it's always like, I, I kind of, is something that I talk about in the course, like email in very few cases is you know, email is not the foundation of someone's business. It's a pillar of yeah. the business. There is a, another foundation like the brand itself. And then there are other pillars that are also like supporting the business basically. Okay. And so you have to, unless your brand is built specifically to support crazy email stuff, you have to email in proportion to what your brand or your business can actually manage. So for instance, I, with one of my e-commerce clients, I don't tell them to respond because I know that our support team isn't big enough to actually respond to all of those. Mm -hmm. And that's going to actually do more harm than good. If I tell people to respond and then they don't get answered, boom, like that's, we've just shot our opportunity at a connection. Interesting. But how about, but then how, I mean, this is maybe a stupid question, but I don't know much about email, so I don't understand the mechanics of it. I mean, I'm starting out a list. uh, Well, I have a list and I'm going to start emailing them. So I'm just wondering like why how can I, you know, there's open rates, but I'm always worried. I'm going to get marked on spam if people aren't, because I I was told by somebody or I heard somewhere that people have to respond back to you and use the email back. So I'm always worried Mm -hmm. that, you know, I have my main, you know, company email and I'm like, well, I'm going to create another one because I don't want my main company email to be mixed with the email list just in case it starts getting marked as spam. So how do you avoid getting marked as spam or getting, get, getting into that, you know, nasty promo tab or, or stuff like that? If people are not responding back to you, is there other techniques? Yeah. Well, I mean, okay. So from if, first of all, like as a guru, from your business perspective, kind of as a guru, it, it's, inherently natural that when people join your list that you have the op- you open up the opportunity to have a conversation like for them to have a conversation with you yeah. so that kind of by all means in your um by all means like in your opening your welcome email should you be like hey i'd love to 
X, Y, Z, like it doesn't really matter any reason to have them respond back because it makes sense. Like you're connecting maybe for the first time. So that's kind of logical. And on kind of, if you're, if you're bringing in a small amount of leads, like that's something that's a lot more manageable, or maybe you have a team member that can actually respond to those. Okay. Um, so that, um, I guess that is responding back basically tells the email platforms that you're a legit thing, a legit thing because <laughs> Google and Gmail, I mean, and Yahoo and Hotmail, they're always looking out for the number one, which it, for, for the best interest of their users, yes. which means not actually allowing businesses to bother them. <laughs> that's Damn. kind of their main, I know, but that's their goal. Like they don't actually, they're, they're like, ah, oh, man, people don't like it when businesses email them. Maybe we should try and keep that from happening. Yeah. <laughs> Which is their goal. So we're like, okay, how do we stay in their good graces so we don't get penalized basically for our behavior? Yeah. Um, and you're going to find a wide range of kind of advice and, um, and kind of opinions, I guess. I, you know, I, you mentioned Troy earlier. He's an expert at getting people out of the promo tab um, and into the into primary. That's his thing. There was also an interview recently with a very well respected long term email marketer that is like, that's BS. <laughs> um, and he's like, and here's how I can prove that it's, you know, that it's BS. So basically, um, we we do have best practices, which are kind of like. Don't be, don't use trigger words. Don't be overly salesy. Don't send out, blast out emails to a bunch of people that don't open them or don't send out content that gets you marked as spam. Have people respond back to you when you can, when, when you can answer them so that you don't damage the reputation. It's still like your relationship with the customer. For sure. Google doesn't know they didn't respond back, but the customer is like, oh my goodness, I responded back to this person and they never got back to me. Like, who were they? Yeah, for sure. Uh, That's the, the, um, you know, if you're trying to sell somebody, you need to make sure that you're, you're not just sending, hoping they reply and then just drop them off, you know? And and that's why, I guess that's why I, I know you keep asking for tips and tricks and I'm like, email marketing doesn't exist in a vacuum. And it's frustrating (laughs) to me that frequently tips are thrown out completely isolated from the context of, yeah, yeah. because, um, what I, you know, I just made a post and about a, a silly little test that I ran for one of my clients. And then this guy gave me this very long response that I haven't responded to yet about all these improvements and things. And so I went and checked the numbers on one of my other clients that I've managed before to see if, and I was exceeding all of the suggestions on, um, on this other client that he, that he was making for this scenario that was listed. Well, I can tell you, I will never hit any of those numbers that he's talking about for this client. Okay. Never. And I'm only going to waste my time. And the client doesn't care enough to pay me to even try and hit those numbers, but his business isn't actually built in a way that will ever facilitate the, those, those numbers that that guy was, was quoting, was, was telling me that I should be looking out for. Whereas conversely, when I looked at this other brand that was just smashing it and they were awesome, we were demolishing all the numbers that he gave me because the brand like resonated with the audience. So like I can, I can tell, you know, I could be like numbers, these numbers, but hit this and do that. No, no, I appreciate that. It's all contextual because like, if you're selling a t-shirt, you can't be like, you should have 30% open rates. 
<laughs> I mean, <laughs> you don't know, like, what kind of t-shirt are you selling? Is it a very special save the planet? No one else in the world has it? Okay, cool. Maybe that people, you'll get 30% open rates. Okay. But you're not going to get 30% open rates if you're just selling. <laughs> like, a cotton you, American apparel shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Like odds are you're probably not going to, and um, I don't know, like there was a a big guru years ago in the e-commerce space, and he was pumping. He was like thirty percent of your emails, your revenue should come from email, or thirty three percent. And it comes to find out he's in like the top three ads. He was in the top three ad spend for Facebook. Oh yeah. That, that helps, right? <laughs> You're and I'm like, it. well, duh. Yeah. <laughs> well, also, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that you say that, you know, what it sounds like to me, what you're saying is basically you just have to test for your niche and, and email yeah. is something like a work in progress where you'll try two emails a week, then you'll try three and realize, Oh, three's too much. Now we go back to two. And you know, it just feels like you just almost have to, like, I do this on a merchant account perspective. I do this with clients when we're testing like conversions of different payment modes. I say, just yeah. open a, an Excel spreadsheet, write the date, write what you changed and then yeah. in three weeks from now, we'll see if that worked. So it seems like exactly. that's what you're saying for email. Just try something and then wait a couple of weeks and then try something else and kind of tweak your model based on your specific business. Exactly. Yeah. Your customers. And like, um, I, cause that's what it's all about. It's about your customers and email is a channel that you can connect with them, um, and promote your stuff. And realistically, this I do say like <laughs> I say, you know, your goal of email is to sell them or to get them to stick around long enough that you that they buy something from you. Yeah, that's, well, that's, there you go. You heard it here first. That's the <laughs> the tip of the the tip of the week. No, I mean it's it's sometimes you know the gurus and and people who give really because I've been trying to come up with a strategy and, and and it's it's confusing and even let's say for somebody who's junior starting into in email copywriting, it's like it's hard for them to kind of understand what would make somebody happy. But I think this approach of saying, well, just kind of test different things and test for the different markets and then different niches and you'll find the right formula. That's basically, I mean, it, it, it sounds a little bit boring, but it's the truth. Yeah. Well, I mean, and the thing is like, you can find uh, best practices exist. Like there are unique, you, you should have these automated series. One email a week is probably too little <laughs> at this point in time with how engaged we are, but it isn't. Pauline Longden sends out a one email a week. She's an amazing copywriter. I look forward to that email. She's got, but she's got a ravenous fan group that is committed to that. Yeah. Um, that is committed to her. So she can do that. Um, but daily emails, it, it depends a hundred percent on the brand. And, but I can tell you, Sending out one email is way better than sending no emails. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's the, the name of the game is, is, is trying instead of just waiting mm -hmm. by the sideline. And that's with everything in business, like for myself too, like when I just try something like this podcast was, it was also something that I'm trying. I was like, well, you know, I'm not a great writer, but I do like talking to people and I want to inform people. So this is my platform. So, I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it's improved over the weeks and you just try and, and so, and, and as I, you know, do more and more episodes, I get better at it. I'm getting more leads from it. I'm getting people who are contacting me. So it's, it's the same thing kind of in almost every area of business. But with email, the interesting thing, um, I think that as a medium, it's interesting for a lot of, you know, businesses because there's also less like compliance per se. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like if you're doing Facebook ads or, or YouTube ads or even native and, and so forth, you have different you know, a lot of kind of stricter rules. Is there any strict rules that you have to abide by with email or you're pretty much a little bit more free to, to say as, as you wish? Yeah. I mean, well, it's nothing like writing compliance for Facebook ads. Cause I, I just wrote an ad and then turned it into an email. And it was great because I got to punch up basically the, <laughs> I got to kind of like punch up the ad in in a sense but you're the i guess the biggest thing to be careful of is you want to avoid sounding scammy um because yes like google 
and Yahoo and Hotmail, they have softwares that are, they have algorithms that are reading your email and looking for <laughs> things. Uh, and that, so can you never say, like, can you not say free in an email? No, nah, you can. Like, it's fine. It's it's not so much like this one word necessarily will derail your whole thing. Yeah. Um. With the my the, the finance client, we do free trainings all the time. We talk about that the training is free okay. because that's what it is. It's a free training. Now I don't say free training, free training, free training. I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm like, free, 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 free. but like. <laughs> You know, I'm not going to be like, there's no charge for this training 17 times in an email. For sure. I, I, so like you can, you can say other things, but also, and this is what this other, you know, the kind of like longer term email marketer was saying, like at the end of the day, it really, it depends more on the relationship with the customer than what types of thing I, my one client, I know that he's going to promotions. Okay. We still have 24% open rates. Oh, and the promo tab is, is like, it is like the, the, like, I don't know, like the devil's place or, or, or the hell of email. People talk about it. Like it's, you know, it's, it's, you never want to be there, but a 24% open rate is pretty good. I mean, for that's, e-commerce, it's like yeah. 7% higher than standard. That's yeah. fantastic for like apparel. That's a great open rate wow. for that type of thing. I, you know, I, I, but the, um, and people, yeah, people still open them. But the thing is, is before, before I was even brought on, the client had some practices and things that damaged their reputation that did these things. And I over, I told you, I mentioned him earlier, like he doesn't actually care about all this stuff. He's, he's just happy to have like kind of a steady paycheck for it coming in from his business. So he's not oh. going to preoccupy himself with all these things. So I'm not going to beat myself up trying to solve all these problems that he doesn't care about. And the email revenue, you know what, that what we saw a drastic increase when he started fixing his back end. That's when things started going up, when he like got his shipping processes in place, when he got his customer service in place and people stopped getting burned by his practices, like as a business, our, e our email revenue started going up. I didn't even wow. change what I was writing and I we saw <laughs> awesome. these massive lists. <laughs> yeah. You know, so like, it's so, um, there, there are, I, I can tell you best practices like, when I write an email, I'm trying to do three things. I'm trying to connect. I'm trying to give them context for why they should care <laughs> about what I'm talking about. And then I'm trying to convert, like get them to click or take an action. That's yeah. what I'm trying to do with every email. Hi, you know me, we're, you know, we're, I run my list. I'm connecting with you as a person, story, something that is why I, and then I like kind of put the bait out there into why I'm introducing something and trying to convince them that they should care about it. <laughs> Basically, so the context of our conversation and yes. then asking them to do something basically. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the formula and you have to, I mean, is there is there a typical length that you find works for, for let's say your e-commerce clients in terms of email? Uh, yeah, well, I probably around, um, uh, yeah. No, no. <laughs> shorter, but like shorter can be, should be 50 words. Shorter can be less than 200. Wow. Okay. So I mean, but that's still uh, pretty, that's like a, a quick minute kind of thing. Yeah. In terms of yeah. That's the thing. You're looking at two minute reads maximum. Okay. Really probably 45 second reads. Oh, that's great. That's yeah. That's a good tip. I do find that I do. Um, I, past one scroll, I usually stop. So that's probably a good exactly. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like what well, hello, welcome to most people. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're trying to, and like when you are, when you have a business that's doing crazy numbers and email is a, is a massive contributing factor, you can start optimizing for half percents. Yeah. It's because it's, that's going to be a game changer. 
But most businesses, the majority of people out there, a 1% in, you know, a half percent increase, a 1% increase is going to be nominal in comparison to how much effort they expended oh, yeah. to make that happen. Yeah. So like if you're, you know, you've got probably got, when you say like, I haven't had time to grow, to grow a business list. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Like you're trying to grow a business. You got like 58 things on your plate. I, yeah. Business, I mean, maybe email would be, I know email would be beneficial to you. Maybe email might not be as beneficial as some of the other things you're doing, depending on where you're at for your business. Now, maybe you've got all these other things going well enough that you can include, you can plug email in now and it's going to like have an awesome, like explosive effect. And I love to see that happen. But I start, I've started with stores at kind of zero and you see their email revenue, it's like a couple thousand dollars a month. And they're just like, well, you, maybe you would have just been better off probably using what you were paying for me to get ads, to get more traction. Yeah. Sometimes the juice isn't <laughs> worth the squeeze. And, and that's, that's, exactly, you know, yeah. it's, it's like, you know, and I say this all often because my service is similar to that. Sometimes it's like, you know, if somebody's just looking for, a, you know, an inexpensive merchant account because they just want to plug it in and, and get their store running, you know, Stripe and stuff like that is good. Obviously, if you're in a high risk business, you, you, you can just look for price. But when you're at the, you know, uh, six figures plus a month and that half a percent or that 1% or whatever, that's when you need, something a little bit more, you know, uh, specialized. And when you need some technique yeah. before that, there's no point in paying the extra, uh, you know, if you're just accepting payments and so forth. Um, so it's, it's similar, I think, to most every aspect of the business is just how much effort are you willing to put in? And is it worth all that extra time and money and frustration if it's just going to, you know, cause a little blip that's going to be almost unnoticeable, uh, in your overall, you know, uh, revenue mix, but, um, thank you for, I mean, I, I appreciate all these, you know, their, their tips. It's, it's more advice, right? It's because it, it's refreshing <laughs> for me at least because I'm not in this world, but I hear so many people giving me all these rules and how many times I should do and this, and you're like, just do, you know, start and see what works, which is great advice. I think, yeah. and the best tip that I've heard, um, do you have, Talking about now, you might have some tips now specifically about technology. Um, I wanted yeah. to kind of just wrap it up and, and talk a little bit on the tech side, because I mean, I know you're you're a big fan of Clavio and you, you mm-hmm. have, you know, some training there, but there's also active campaign. There's a whole bunch of different, um, you know, softwares that people use. Is there one you prefer or is there industry specific ones? Like what's what are your thoughts on on the technology behind it? Yeah, so they're going to be. Um, it's going to vary a little bit based off of what your industry is. Just don't use MailChimp. Uh, <laughs> okay. You heard it that's here first. Basically, <laughs> the big thing is like, yeah, well, no, you didn't hear it from me first. You heard it from a lot of other people. But basically, um, email service, it's called an ESP, an email service provider. They have their own domain reputation. And basically, every user can benefit from their domain reputation. Uh, So at this point, MailChimp, because it was less than picky on the types (laughs) of people that (laughs) it uh, it, it allowed to to work work with their platform, they just tanked their kind of (laughs) reputation as a whole. So you have to set up your own kind of DNS records and stuff to benefit. It's just not worth the hassle. There's other things out there, but so Clavio is the best probably when it comes to, sh- to e-commerce and Shopify, they integrate so good, like with Shop- oh, nice. Shopify, which is a hosting platform. Um, they were, um, it fills in, in a lot of ways, it feels like they were kind of built for that platform. They do integrate with like WooCommerce and some other ones as well, but so they're really awesome for e-commerce. I would not use Clavio for like myself, as an entrepreneur, just sending out emails to my own list though. I would do, um, you could active campaign is really good, but that's pretty, that's pretty uh, higher tier as well. You've got a lot of people that do, I, I, there's so many out there. I, yeah. Um, I'm going to draw a blank awkwardly on the spot, but like convert kid is one of the ones and basically 
everybody is going to have their own opinion and somebody's going to have a story about how this didn't do really well. And then they move to this one and it's better, but then you find out someone else that you really respect uses that other platform with no problems. Yeah. So I prefer that you pay more attention to like what types of features that you get, which is basically um, you want to be able to segment. So you want to basically be able to assign tags based off of customer subscriber behavior. Okay. Um, so that way you're not emailing just this big pool. And then you want to have the option to be able to set up automations. So the things that can use the evergreen flows series, oh, there's so many different names for them, but the ones that go out automatically <laughs> um, and you, you're going to want like, you want to have some base level I guess it depends on what you're doing, but you want to have some base level customizations to that. And like, probably if you're selling something, you want to be able to split test and not everyone will give you the option to split test, at least on base plans, oh, nice. even yeah. on those automations. And split testing can be a game changer. Uh, um, even with smaller numbers, if you find out that you're doing, you know, things are, that's one of the, the needle movers that I encourage people to, to try out regardless um, because it can still, um, it can still have a big impact, but those are the types of things that you're looking at. I, I'm not a good enough authority. I haven't used all of them, honestly, because I've worked, um, I've worked pretty much with just Clavio and active campaign. Okay. Well, I mean, it seems like if you're more like maybe a coach or an entrepreneur and so forth, maybe active campaigns a little bit more suited in your opinion, than in Clavio mm -hmm. is more like a yeah. e-commerce e kind of mm -hmm product company, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, mm -hmm. no, that, that's interesting. And, and, uh, you know, AB testing and, and split testing and so forth is, is also a very good tip because, um, you know, a lot of times we don't know what's going to work unless we try something different and something completely yeah. out of the box. Right. So mm -hmm. even with a small list, would you do it, let's say with a list of, you know, a couple of thousand, or is there, where, where do you find it's worth it to, to split test? Um, well, I mean, first of all, it depends on how much you care <laughs> is the first thing, but, um, let's see. You can, you, you could pretty much always be split testing after you have probably 2000 people. Okay. So and you should, you can have like a baseline. Would you say like, if you're starting a list or if you're nurturing your list, would you have a couple of months of data and then start split testing? Yeah, well, it, I guess it depends on what you're split testing for. So you can split test even just emails, I mean, subject lines. So okay. that's something that Clavio does that's awesome. I frequently, for my clients, set up even just the weekly campaigns, they have two different email subject lines that are going out for two hours and then they send the subsequent amount to whatever had the highest open rates oh, in this nice. trial. So that's something that's like very simple, that's beneficial. Um, whereas you do, so if we're talking about automated things, you do have to have, um, you have to have enough traffic going through them for the, the numbers to be substantial because basically any number, any, any small number over the long, long amount of time could show anything. So you need to have, ideally you're looking for, you're looking to be able to hit probably a thousand in each variation within, within no more than a week. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, probably, I, I, I mean, you can do, you could probably stretch that out to two weeks probably, but like, ideally you're looking to have that many recipients um and you know to have well really yeah really you want yeah a thousand in each variation kind of within within a couple of weeks probably to be able to get like actual relevant Good data data 
Okay. Well, that's, that's very interesting. I, I'm going to, I'm going to do something very unscripted and I'm going to ask you a, few, uh, a couple of random questions. That's fine. Uh, yeah, of course. Cause I, I'm, I'm curious, and this is, this is personal opinion, no science behind it, just whatever, whatever Brennan thinks. If you're, uh, you know, this is, I talk about pricing and, and how people could price themselves. And it's, it's a common topic on a lot of like the boards and so forth, you know, email it being a 45 to two minute email and it being short and so forth. Obviously people see it as something that should be priced a lot less than let's say a long form copy or whatever the case sure. is. How, mm -hmm. how would somebody that's like maybe just starting out or a couple of years, less than a couple of years, let's say two, a year or two in to being an email copywriter price their emails? Would they price per email? Would they do like a, a monthly package? What's, what's your, your best advice? Yeah, sure. So You've got kind of two things here. First of all, if you're just an email copywriter, like shooting over the Google Doc, you're not you're not going to be able to <laughs> earn that much for a long time, probably, unless you just get to work with, unless you're working for a company and get some killer sales and then get some great referrals, basically through that. Okay. But um, you know, I've the email, yeah, I've generated a, like in between four or five, probably million dollars with email for clients at this point. And the, they paid me mostly because I knew how to do the, the software and oh. the copywriter was the bonus for, for them, which is, that's kind of like what my, that's was the heart behind my course that I can explain later. But so I've actually had a lot of opinions. I was just uh, ranting maybe about this in a group chat earlier with some of my copywriter friends um, because I, common common advice kind of out there is or the the popular advice is like you shouldn't charge you shouldn't get paid less than a hundred dollars per for e per email okay. and I didn't start making hundred dollars per email until two or three years in and that was with also offering email management like okay. as part of my services. Well, I agree and because so, that's, that's the number one thing I find. Um, like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot of writing, like for not me, but like I hire writers for the blogs and, and for the blog posts and for like a couple of website redesigns and so forth. And now I'm looking into the email and a lot of people are like, Oh, I'll do an email for 50 bucks, 75 bucks. I'm like, yeah, but I don't want to have to deal with the, the, the Clavio active campaign, that stuff. That's, mm -hmm. that's the stuff I have zero interest in learning right now. And just my mind share isn't there. Yeah. Me, you giving me an email and telling me pop it in on day three. Oh, you know, like, no, no, you, thank they you. just made more work for you. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, that's, that's, that, you know, that's a, a great thing, I guess, for people who are looking to break into email, maybe their copywriters are looking to do some email is almost like learn at least one of the platforms really, really well. Yeah. And then, I mean, at least for me as a business owner, I would pay somebody a lot more money if they were like, Hey, I'll manage the list. I'll tell you it's working. I'll tell you what's not working. All I want to mm -hmm. do is read the email and say, yes, I agree with this or no, I don't agree with this. Cause obviously it's my voice, yep. it's my company and so forth, but I don't sure. care about like the automations and who mm -hmm. does No, <laughs> I find I've been looking into active campaign and all the different softwares and it is like, it is a job. Like it is it's a literally, yeah. yes, it's a nightmare. I had to, mm -hmm. like, I was like, I signed up for it. I looked at this. I was like, what? I'm like, turn this yep. off. I have no time for this. This is, I would need mm -hmm. like hours a day to manage this stuff or learn it. And, you know, so, I mean, I definitely think that, uh, that is a very underutilized technique is saying almost that you're a active campaign or you're a Clavio or whatever expert. And guess mm -hmm. what? I have these great emails that convert for active campaign or whatever yeah, platform. That's so. exactly it. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I mean, anecdotally, like my own experience, I, I made my first year freelancing, I made just $15,000. That was it, like freelancing. And that was, it wasn't until I, I made like six or seven or 8,000 of that within three months. And that's when I started positioning myself as an email marketer. Nice. And then all of a sudden I went from doing like a $1,200 a month to like five, six, seven K to being booked out to what I could do, like at my, at what I, my current level, at my level was because 
all of a sudden I became infinitely more valuable. Like I said, like a copywriter for someone that's a, I have a lot of opinions on this, but for someone that's, <laughs> that's new, um, you know, if they're not getting clients, they're probably charging too much just realistically. Like that's, that's the reality of the game. And it's awesome that there's a lot of insight and advice from successful people. Um, and there are people that have been able to participate in various groups or well connected and have had their careers kind of like skyrocketed, you know, in a short amount of time. But unless you are those people, you're probably going to have a different route, <laughs> which is the, which is the slow build, you know, and that yeah. means selling what people will buy yeah. at a price that they'll pay for. And then, and growing it from there, or you add a cheat code, which is basically like get, add something else to your services that actually makes you valuable to a business owner. And then even then, don't try and charge them out the wazoo, like just actually get some clients. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, what, what I hear from you is, and what I like is that it's a done for you formula, right? Like you're, you're approaching business people, people who are starting a list or want to, you know, nurture their list and stuff. And you're saying here, I'll send you 10 emails on a Google doc, and then they don't know what to do with it. And it's like, oh, yeah. it's going to take forever and no thanks. Um, if you're saying, look, I'll do this for this price and you don't have to think about it. For me as a business owner, it's like, well, you know, I can give somebody, you know, a thousand bucks or whatever the case is and they'll do this. And in the end, if it converts, meaning like you actually do a good job and I get, you know, 10 extra clients at the end of the month, great. I'll pay you more for it because now I want it. I want it because I know it's going to do 10 extra clients versus you're approaching me. You're saying I'm going to manage your email list. I have no idea what this is going to do. It might be a complete waste of time. Um, yeah. And you want $3,000 and you have no examples of anything that you've ever done mm -hmm. to show me. So it's like, well, yeah. So I find that, you know, copywriting and email, email copy and all this, it, it's a very subjective, um, it's, it's very difficult. Like if you're a doctor, you know, it's, you get paid this per hour or you get paid, yeah. you know, whereas this type of stuff, uh, even, you know, in my business, people value me at different, you know, amounts, exactly, depending on yeah. what they're looking for. And I have to find a way to talk to each person and know that this is going to cost me, for example, this much time or whatever the case is. It's the same thing. If you, if you are very, uh, talented and you think, you know, you could do a really good job for somebody, you know, that's a, a great tip is, you know, offer a done for you formula, charge a price, and then renegotiate in 60 days when things are kind of rolling and you're getting mm -hmm. those conversions. So, uh, and, and I actually have a very similar story to you, Brennan, is uh, my first year in my business, I, had, I made $17,000 and that's not American, <laughs> that's Canadian. Oh, so that's no. even less. <laughs> It's yeah. just at $12,000. Yeah, so yeah. until I found that formula, because it was, you know, you, you have to mm -hmm. try a couple of things and what's going to work, what's going to make people kind of respond to what you're offering. So um, that's the name of the game. But I did want to give you a couple of minutes to tell us a little bit about your course, because I'm actually really curious. And I, I want to oh, obviously have so. our listeners, um, you know, come in and buy it if, if it if it suits their needs. So tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, sure. So it's basically... Um, like, like I said, so I started as a copywriter um, and worked as a copywriter for nearly, I, I started working with an email marketing agency six or seven months in, but I was a copywriter exclusively kind of for like a year. Um, and then I, I got thrown in with this agency because they needed a copywriter, but it was ground floor. It was very small startup type thing and they didn't actually have enough people. So I was, they were like, do this, do this. And I'm like, this is my biggest gig yet. And I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what all this stuff is. So I'm just like on the internet consuming all these blogs and stuff, you know, trying to figure out what is email marketing. Um, and I found basically that um, a lot of the, a lot of the information that was available is from high level people that are like what I'm saying, like they're spending, you know, millions of dollars on ads or they've spent bajillions of dollars getting their products tested, or they've got a skincare brand. So it's a consumable, so they can obviously put people on auto bill, like all these types of things. Like those were the people that were producing the majority of the content because it looks really good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the numbers are awesome. Um, and then I realized that that's not most businesses experience or case. 
and there was very little information that was actually relevant to the normal business person. And by normally even like six, seven, like six is small, seven and eight figure businesses. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I basically put together what's called lean and mean email marketing because it's essentially um, fire hose of all of the basics. Nice. So, and it's cool. Most of I'm pretty much with the exception of my recent Clavio training, which is all, which is a live recording. I it's just like 60 minutes. Everything is less than all the lessons are less than 20 minutes uh, mm. because I, felt like that was all the time that was needed to share, but <laughs> and all of those are, are valuable and important. So I'd say kind of the, it's the plus, it's the, the, the skill that you can add to your tool belt basically to actually make a copywriter more valuable to a business owner, because then you can go in and it's really cool because I've, I've broken down um, act, things as to like actually give them, tell them what to put in, individual emails and send times and what to test for and all of those types of things. So wow. very much like you read a blog and you're like, you should do this. And then I'm like, Hey, this is the thing the blog talks about. This is how you can actually do it practically. So day one, this send time, <laughs> like talk about this content and like a, like um, a, a roadmap, before. basically you're giving, yeah, basically. Okay. okay. Yeah. You know, um, and obviously it's, up to them to like actually build out their skills, but I wanted to make it as comprehensive as possible. It's like, what did I wish I had four years ago? That's amazing. No, I mean, and that's super useful because if you're, if you're a copywriter looking to try, try uh, email, you know, this is a good course maybe. Cause I, I do like when, when I go somewhere and I like any type of course where it's like 15, 20 minutes, or like under mm -hmm. 30, you know, those, those, those courses that you buy that it's like a 20 modules and it's like 30 hours. You're like, oh, I just, I can't, yeah. no mind share. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have, we have so many, even though you might get the value that you need from it, it just seems like it's going to always, I, I tend to put off things that seem like they're going to take a long time. I'll just yeah. do it later. I'll do it later. So, I mean, uh, where, where can, where can one get your course? Uh, yeah. So I just, I'll have to, you can find it on, in my Facebook page, but I'll okay. have to just give you a, a link to that to okay. put on the thing. But yeah. I think the, the coolest thing that I guess I'm, I'm most proud of is I, I've priced it at just $197 right now. So it's I, also, since I made $15,000 my first year, I was like, what is the price point that people could actually, could, yeah, I was like, something what, what could, could afford, I yeah. actually afford, I, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, at that, at that time, so. That's awesome. Yeah, well, we'll I'll, put it in the, we'll good. put it in the show notes, but anyway, I, I, you're on, you're active on Facebook. So I'm sure uh, people can find you on Facebook and send you a note if, if they can, but we'll put that in the show notes. And um, thank you so much, Brennan. Uh, this was a, a yeah. really interesting conversation. And I love, I love the, you know, the raw feedback and the realness of, you know, yeah. Hey, don't, there's not these rules and we try different things. So thank you so much. I really appreciate mm -hmm. all your time. Um, and we'll be in touch very soon. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be on here. Bye, Brennan. Thank All you. All right. Bye-bye. Hope you found today's session valuable. If you have any questions for me or just want to connect, please feel free to visit my website, mariasparagis.com. That's M-A-R-I-A-S-P-A-R-A-G-I-S.com. I'd love to hear what you're working on. So drop me a line on any hot button issues your business is experiencing. And remember, don't worry about failure. You only have to be right once. 